I love it when I get to talk about Fleem. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright, and welcome to my shop. We are talking about saw sharpening again today. Uh, last time we went over sharp sharpening a rip saw, and today we're going to be focusing on a crosscut saw. Now, if you don't know the difference between a rip saw and a crosscut saw, I have a video on that where I go and show the specifics. But basically, a rip saw is like a whole bunch of chisels taking a gouge out of the wood, whereas a crosscut saw is like a knife that slices the wood. So we're going to be making a whole bunch of little knife edges with the exact same file and same setup that we had for the rip saw. But it's going to get a little bit more technical because we're going to be talking about fleam and some of the other angles that make a crosscut saw um, far more effective for slicing the grain as opposed to gouging it out like a chisel. Now before I get into this in depth, I'm going to put out a bit of a warning here. Now every saw sharpening guru you talk to is going to tell you their specific way of doing it. And every other everyone you talk to is going to be doing it a slightly different way. Uh, so. Take everything I say with a grain of salt and take everything you hear from every other saw sharpening video with a grain of salt. I'm going to tell you the ways that I've found that work very well for me. And you may find that someone else says, hey, no, no, this is the right way. Just keep in mind, there is no right or wrong way. There's only sharpening a saw. And if the saw cuts wood, it's right. <laughs> so you really can't go wrong. And on that same thought, a lot of people I've heard to, are, are worried about sharpening, sharpening a, saw, a saw. What if I mess it up? What if I, what if I destroy the saw? And I have to tell you, uh, if you are going to sharpen your very first saw, I can promise you that it'll be sharper when you're done than when you start. Uh, you really can't mess it up. And the only way to learn is to jump in and do it. And you're going to make some mistakes along the way, but the saw will still work. The saw will still be a functioning saw. saw and it will still be sharper than it was before you started. So that being said, you know, if you're really worried about it and you want to practice, um, go pick up a cheap $5 handsaw at some antique store and go to town on it, and you will see that it isn't that hard once you jump into it. If you do really want to practice and you don't want to work on an actual saw, then Kennebec Saws, um, the same guy that I uh, talked about last channel, he actually has a saw practice kit that you can get. And it's a, a plate with the tooth in it and it actually walks you through it. Really cool resource, so if this is something that really scares you, getting a practice set might be something that's worthwhile for you. But uh, that being said, let's dive in. Now this is an 8 ppi crosscut saw and I really like this. It is it's long enough that you could probably call it a hand saw as opposed to a panel saw. This is when I want to hack through some material but I want to leave a clean surface. 8 ppi, the teeth are small enough that they're going to leave a clean surface but yet aggressive, aggressive enough you can cut through some larger material. Now to show the difference between a crosscut teeth and a rip saw tooth is the rip saw is basically like a whole bunch of chisels in a row like this. And as the chisels merge through the wood, they're basically like tiny little planes taking off tiny little curls of wood. At least in theory, that's what it should be doing. Whereas a crosscut saw is like a bunch of knives. And on each side, there are knives that are sliding through the wood and they're slicing it in two different paths. And each of those slices is going to cut through the fibers of the wood. So if you're going across the grain, the knife will cut through it far easier. Whereas if you're going with the grain, the chisel will actually peel out along the grain much easier. So we're going to be wanting to create these knife blades. And every other tooth is going to have a flat spot on the outside, and then the other one will have a flat spot on the opposite side. So every other tooth, it'll be filed opposite, so the bevel will be on the inside of each tooth. The other thing is that there will be set in the saw, and the set is basically angling the tooth out. So on the, the tooth that has a flat side on this side of the board will be angling away, and the tooth that has a flat side on the other side of the board will be angling the opposite direction. And that way, they will basically be cutting a slightly wider groove through the wood than the thickness of the plate, so the plate doesn't bind up as much. So now let's talk about the set in the teeth. So that's basically how far do the teeth stick out past the plate. And you do that with a set. You can also do that with a hammer and an anvil, and you slowly go down each one and you tap each one. Um, I don't like to do that. This tends to be a little more standard and until it's something you really want to get into, I'm um, just getting a good saw set will do for you. All of mine are antiques that I picked up at uh, the Midwest Tool Collectors Meets. Um, I think I paid like a buck or two bucks a piece. And a lot of these older ones have uh, far more adjustments that will allow you to do different sized teeth. Uh, this is my go-to one. It's an old Stanley. Um, and it will allow me to do everything from most of my small dovetails up to my largest uh, frame saws. Most of the newer ones now will either come to a range and they'll do from like a 10 TPI 
um, and smaller and then 10 TPI and larger. And so you're going to end up with two of these if you're wanting to get to, into um, different broader ranges. But some of these older ones, uh, the hammer on the inside is small enough yet strong enough that it will fit on the small teeth but yet be strong enough to bend the, uh, the larger teeth. Now I'm going to be getting into how to sharpen this in the future. Uh, I just now want to bring this up because a lot of people really like to set the teeth before sharpening it. I really don't. I like to set the teeth after sharpening it. So that's what I'm going to be doing here. Uh, I'm not going to be setting these teeth until I'm done with the actual sharpening stage. Uh, play with it. See if it's something you like. You might like to actually come through and set the teeth first and then sharpen it. Um, but for me, I like to set up afterwards. So with a crosscut saw, just like with a rip saw, the first thing we want to do is grab our file and run this all the way along there and flatten them all out, bring them all to the same height. And I'm again, I'm looking at all these points and I'm seeing if there are any dull edges and any sharp edges. And I'm seeing about half of these I've hit and about half of them I need to go again. So this one I'm probably going to have to run this a few times on. Okay, so this one needed a lot of work. It was a good ways out of whack, but now I have a shiny spot on the top of every tooth. If you want to see what I'm talking about, I showed the shiny spot on the top of the tooth in the last video. Okay, so now it's time to start talking about fleam and rake. And we need to actually figure out what we what do we want to do for this saw. Now the easiest thing to do is if I if I trust the last person who sharpened this, I can put the file in there and just put my finger down. And I know that I'm about this fleam and about this rake. So I can actually then come in and rotate this to be flat. And then I can rotate this to be parallel. And I can see that the last time someone did this, they were right around a 20 degree fleam and then around a five degree rake. Now, since I was the last person to sharpen this, um, I know that's about what I like, um, about a five degree rolling forward and then about 20 degrees of fleam, so turning it this way. Some people will tell you you should have like 30 degrees, 35 degrees, or only 10 degrees. Um, it's often the hybrid saw that has a little bit of fleam in a uh, rip pattern will have about 10 degrees or like 8 degrees of, of uh, fleam. Um, so you kind of got to play with it back and forth. The other question is about slope when you angle it down this way or back this way. A lot of people are going to swear about it that you have to have slope um, a certain amount one way or the other. And in all honesty, I, I don't feel that much difference with slope about putting a little bit in, so I don't. I keep the, flat, the file flat. Uh, I don't angle it down one way or the other. Um, you may find after doing a few saw, saws, you want to experiment with it, add a little bit of slope and see what it does. Great, go for it. Um, personally, I don't like it. Um, I just like a little bit of fleam and a little bit of rake, and that's my personality. So for a saw about this size, um, I'm gonna have about I'm going to have about 20 degrees of fleam and then about uh, 5 degrees of rake forward. And that's, that's really where I like it right there. On my really big frame saw, um, I'll actually have zero rake, uh, so it'll be the, the top of the file will be perfectly flat. Um, and then I'll put in about 30 degrees of fleam so that there's a very, very sharp knife edge on these. And that's so I can, I can munch through the material very quickly. Um, but for like a, a fine carcass saw, I might only put in like 15 degrees of fleam. Um, and then I'll have a little bit heavier rake. So I might go to like 7, 8, maybe 10 degrees of rake, um, somewhere around that range. But that's my personal choice. Um, everyone's going to be a little different. Experiment with it. Find out what you like. So the next thing we need to do is grab our file now that we've set it up with the fleam and rake. And I like to start at the heel and go to the toe. Some people like to start the toe and go to the heel. Um, find what you like, but we're going to do every other tooth. And it's just as simple as I want to focus on the tooth in front of the file. So the tooth that is forward of the file is the one I'm looking at. I'm going until I get rid of that shiny spot. And every couple teeth, I'm going to refocus on this and make sure that I'm still in parallel with this guide. That visual reference just makes this a little bit easier to make sure that I'm still rolling on the same side. So here you can get a bit of an idea. There's no shiny spot on the top of this tooth here. That's the one I just hit. So next, I'm going to skip this and I'm going to go in between these two here. And I'm going to try and get rid of that shiny spot on top of that second tooth. So I'm going to set it in here, get this angle correct. And still a little bit of a flat spot. And just a hair, so just a light pass. There, I've gotten rid of that shiny spot on the top of it, but you can still see there's a shiny spot on the tooth behind it and a shiny spot on the tooth in front of it. We're going to hit those when we flip this around. So now we can just keep going. We just did that one, so we're going to skip that one and go on to this one. And keep 
keep it going. And the way I choose which side of the tooth to be on is I'm looking at the teeth and the tooth that is leaning, um, I want it to be leaning towards the obtuse side of this angle that I'm creating. So you can see here, this is an acute angle here and this is an obtuse angle here. I want the tooth to be leaning towards the obtuse angle, not towards the acute angle. And that will give you your knife edge on there. So I'm just gonna continue on down this and then take you to the point where we flip it around and do the other side. Okay, now we've gotten to the point where some people really get confused. I've filed everything from one side, going this way at a certain fleam and a certain rake. Now I wanna turn the saw around. Now I could open this up, turn the saw around, but one of the things I love about this vice system is it's really easy to turn the saw around. Just grab the saw, turn it around, and you're good to go. You're also still working on the same side and you keep, keep going. So on the other side, it was like this. And so it's raked forward, and then we're matching the angle here. But when I want to turn it around and file on this side, then I actually want it to be back here. So I want to rotate this. So it was at 20 degrees one way. I'm just going to move it over to 20 degrees the other way. Lock that down. So now I have the fleam set correctly. Now I want to set the rake. And on the rake, you got this back here, and it's the exact same thing. I had it 10 degrees one way. I'm just going to roll, roll it 10 degrees the opposite direction. Clock that back down and we're ready to go. And so I now am all ready for the rake and the fleam are all set to go. I just have to remember, rather than having the handle away from me, I'm gonna have the handle toward me. And so now the tooth that is leaning towards me is going to be on this obtuse side, not this acute side like it was before. So that's the hardest thing to think about is that the handle, rather than being this way, is gonna to have to turn this way. So the only thing you have to think about is switch this from one side over to the other, and then switch this from one side over to the other, and you're ready to go. Don't think about the angles, don't think about how it has to go. Just change this from one side to the other and change this from one side to the other. Set it back in there and you're ready to go. So now it's all turned around, our jig is set up. We can then start from the heel and work to the toe just like we did before. Just set it in and we're going to be then looking at number one, keeping this parallel with the saw. Number two, keeping this flat so we don't want to tip it this way or this way. We want to keep it flat and parallel with the saw just visually and hit every other tooth that we missed before. This time, rather than focusing at the tooth in front of the blade, in other words, the tooth away from me, I actually wanna be focusing on the tooth in front of the file, which is now going towards me. So it's just one more thing to kind of think about a little bit. Think about the tooth that is in front of the file, not the tooth that's in front of you. And that one needs a lot of work, actually. And just keep going until that flat spot disappears on the tooth that you're looking at. And then we're just gonna continue on until it's done. And then I can talk to you a little bit about setting the teeth. Now, if we're actually setting the teeth, every set is going to have a different angle or a different amount on there. Just remember, when you're setting the teeth, the farther you set them out, the harder it will be to cut because you're cutting a much wider groove through the wood. But the nice thing about setting the teeth really wide is you have a lot of control. You can actually turn the saw inside the cut and follow the line. So when you're starting out, you may wanna trade some of that efficiency and get a really heavy set giving you far more control in your hand about being where it is actually going in the cut. Um, but once you get into it and you start to run a saw and your hand knows how to run a saw really nicely, just having a tiny little bit of set is all you need to keep the saw from bending and it will cut far smoother and far cleaner. The less set you put on it, the easier it is to push in the wood and also the smoother the surface will be. That's why with like a flush cut saw or a Japanese saw that has almost no set or no set at all, you're gonna really get a really nice smooth surface on it. So in each saw set, you're gonna have an anvil and a hammer, and the hammer will push against the anvil and just bend the tooth over a little bit. You'll have a setting that will either move the anvil or the hammer to push the tooth farther to one side or the other. Most of the time, the size issues on the saw sets are due to the hammer either being too fat for the smaller teeth or it being too weak um, to do the larger teeth. Whereas some of these Stanley ones, I really like the size on this because I can do most all the tiny little teeth and it's still strong enough that I can do the larger teeth. The other reason why people like to set teeth before they sharpen is that you're gonna be sliding this along, the, along all those, uh, those teeth. And as long as you actually pick it up, move it over and set it down, you're not gonna be doing much damage at all to the tips of the teeth you just sharpened. You can keep on moving along the plate. 
and you can see how there isn't that much movement at all in the tooth. It doesn't take much at all to set this. You're just going to slowly work down tooth by tooth, going all the way along, making sure you push the right one and not the wrong one. And then, when I get down to the end, I do the last tooth, then I just flip the saw over, and then I go back again from one end to the other. And start setting them all the opposite direction, making sure I'm hitting the other tooth in between each one. Second verse, exactly the same as the first. Just keep going. So then we can bring it over to the bench and give it a test. And I want to see if it naturally wants to veer one way or the other. That'll let me know if I need to fix anything. Oh, love the feeling of a freshly cut saw. Like butter. Let's see what that grain looks like. Yeah, that's pretty good. I'll take it. So there we go. Freshly uh, sharpened saw. If it does veer one way or the other, um, I talked about last time on how to stone it, just running down the side that it is veering towards. Um, we'll bring those back into true. So that's about it. That's how you sharpen a crosscut saw. Now again, I could spend an entire lifetime learning how to sharpen a saw and become more proficient at it and more specific. And the more time you spend on it, the more you want to become a perfectionist about it. And that's completely a thing to do. But the way I'm kind of showing right now is, you know, the person picks up their first saw and it's dull. How do you actually get the saw sharp and fun functioning fairly well with the least amount of effort? This is a, a fairly quick overview on how to sharpen a saw before going into all of the tiny little specifics. Because some people even come back through with a set of diamond files and refine each of those teeth and make them absolutely perfect. Uh, but that's kind of polishing the turd because, you know, at a certain point you're going to get a diminishing amount of returns and after using it two or three times, is really diamond, uh, diamond plating every one of those teeth going to make much difference? Mm, maybe, maybe not. So my admonition to you is experiment. Play with, the, uh, play with the file, see if you want to change the angle. What angles do you prefer? Do you have a particular angular for a different type of saw or a particular type of use? Um, you never know until you give it a try. So uh, sharpening saws is a great way to experiment to play around with it because there is no right or wrong. There is only not sharpening it, and that's just not the hand tool way. So I hope you enjoyed this. There are a lot of other things I could have talked about, and who knows, maybe I'll do another video in the future um, touching on some more specifics. And if you have any questions, feel free to let me know in the comments below. I'd love to answer those. And that's about it for today. I do want to say thank you to the patrons on Patreon. You guys are the reason why I can keep putting out these videos and uh, providing this content. If you'd like to help out with that, you can find a link to Patreon somewhere down there. <laughs> also, feel free to subscribe or uh, see my behind the scenes videos on my second channel. That's about it for today. Until next time, have a wonderful day.